Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to continue with our study of an introduction to the doctrine of marriage. And once again, I want to remind you that this is not a full doctrine of marriage. It's not the full treatment. We're only looking at uh, a profile, as it were. And uh, our content for today is the major heading of a covenant of commitment, which is a definition of marriage. Subcategory, the psychological glue for marriage, which is communication. And today we're going to take a look at skillful communicating. We've looked at uh, communication in the past, and today we're going to look at skillful communicating. <coughs> I think it's appropriate that we begin with uh, this particular screen, and <laughs> that is the screen of the cell phone. <laughs> And there's a text message that comes in. And the first part of the text message is that the most important thing that you will do today is to ingest Bible doctrine. Now let me emphasize this because there are those individuals who think that there is something more important that they should be doing right now. And it's not. That is human viewpoint, not the divine <laughs> viewpoint. They should be taking in Bible doctrine, and the taking in of Bible doctrine consists of face-to-face -face teaching. It's okay when you take it electronically, but it does not have the same effect. When you take doctrine on an electronic basis or on a study basis, then uh, what you are actually doing is that you should be remasticating, you should be recycling the doctrine that you have re uh, ingested pre pre previously or prior to that time. As a result, then that doctrine will have full effect on your life. While you are here in public assembly, texts, phone calls, emails, tweets, Instagrams, Facebook notifications, etc. are not more important than your receiving Bible doctrine. Besides not giving the Bible its proper respect, you are not respecting this house of worship when you have your cell phone on and you are waiting for a message or a notification of some sort. And that is because you are coming into this assembly, this place, with a divided attention and thus you are giving the Bible second place. It's very important that you learn to determine what your priorities are. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to have uh, the evil guy like the pastor tell you because you haven't been able to decide it on your own. And I know that there are times when a message comes in that something has happened, but really the most important thing that you could ever do in your life is the ingestion of Bible doctrine. I have been here just as you, and I have gotten a, a message that my sister was involved in a highway accident. She was bleeding on the side of the highway. So I know what an emergency is. And so I want to tell you once again that nothing is as important as your taking in of Bible doctrine. Now it's okay to use a tablet while you're in here so long as you're using a Bible app so that you can follow along in the Bible. However, I prefer, as I have said many times before, that you get a New American Standard Bible and follow along in class. The day may come when satellites are knocked out, power is knocked out, and you need to know your Bible, you need to have it on a page, and even more importantly, you need to have it in your soul. This is the most important part uh, of the intake of Bible doctrine. And so it is with this that, once again, it is uh, for you to turn off your cell phones when you are in here. Okay. Communication is a skill. Communication is a skill. Communication is a skill. It's not luck, nor is it a gift, or it isn't even a talent. In fact, the scripture has given us a set of guidelines to follow and those guidelines are found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. 
Let me give you a definition of communication, and we will probably be referring to the graphic that goes along with this uh, on more than one occasion. A definition of communication is communication is a process by which information is transmitted between individuals or organizations in such a way that an understanding response results. Illustration, here's our graphic. You have uh, the figure on the left side of the screen who wants to communicate a thought to the figure on the right side of the screen. And that thought may be a good idea or a bad idea. It's immaterial at this point what kind of an idea it is or what quality of an idea it is. Before that idea or that thought can get to the other person, it needs to be encoded in vocabulary. And it is this encoding that we will look at today in, in some detail. And that encoding into vocabulary finally gets transferred into utterance. That is, the actual articulation that comes from the person's mouth. That articulation is uh, gone across to the other side so that the person hears the utterance, decodes the vocabulary, and then proceeds to understand, maybe, depending as to how clearly the encoding was put together, how intelligently it was put together. And the only way that the original emitter of the thought is going to know whether or not the communication was successful is when the receiver, or the target of his communication, sends a message back, which we call feedback. That feedback makes the communication cycle complete. This way you know that the communication started out with you, it has gone to the other person, and now it comes back. Now this graphic here does not tell us at all as to whether your idea as the communicator was accepted or rejected. It doesn't tell us whether the receiver of the message has given a valid opinion, um, a non-opinion or a bad opinion to what your thought is. One of the problems that exist in matrimonial communication is that when the figure on the right side of the screen decodes the vocabulary, that person does not stop to understand what is being said. Instead, it quickly responds with what is on that person's mind and instead of giving back feedback, saying, I understand, there is a back talk. There is a continuation and an escalation of the argument. And so this is a key place. Now, in this graphic, there are two key places where escalation can be stopped. The first of those places is in the encoding of vocabulary, and so let me put my cursor on it, and let me highlight it so that we can um, be assured of that. The vocabulary encoding, that's the first place. The second place where this is done is in the understanding. If you do not seek to understand what is being said, the communication has not been made. And all that is happening is that you have two people, and they may be on the opposite sides of the table, and they are both moving their jaws, but not moving forward. There is no traction as far as resolving an issue, and this becomes detrimental to a marriage in the long run. Okay, we've seen the illustration. <clears throat> we now need to take a look, or at least uh, understand, what the instruction is, and it is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. So let me read the instruction uh, concerning communication as it is found in the Scripture. Ephesians 4:25 begins this way, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, 
for we are members one of another. <laughs> Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will be grace or give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Verse 32 in the final verse of this chapter, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So we have the instructions listed for us in these verses, and we need to uh, understand the meta-language of marriage, or what is commonly referred to as dishonest communication. <clears throat> And we'll go through this fairly quickly since this is a review. We begin, first of all, with a silent message. This is the message that um, ignores the problem by a silent treatment of the message uh, or by silently enduring the message and the situation. Um, this sometimes is uh, when one party of the marriage becomes a doormat. The other person does all of the talking. There is no interaction between the couple. There is no live communication between the two. One person becomes a doormat and the other person becomes a dictatorial <laughs> tyrant. Then we have the back door message. The back door message. And this is a message where neither the speaker nor the hearer takes responsibility for what they have said or for what has taken place. And the words are, of the message are juggled in such a way that neither the speaker nor the uh, hearer will take responsibility for what is being said. And so just to give a little example, let's say that the job uh, of uh, taking out the garbage needs to be done. And so one member of the of the marriage might say, the garbage didn't get taken out today. What does that mean? It means I didn't take out the garbage, you didn't take out the garbage. Well, whose job is it? Well, figure it out, see. That is an under-responsibility message because no one has taken responsibility for the fault or for the vacancy of that particular activity. Then we have the double bind message. And the double bind message is such where not only do you deliver a direct message, but you overlay it with an emotional overlay to give it that much more emphasis. And that emphasis is usually accompanied with a guilt trip. The guilt trip is like the frosting on the cake. And so this is the message plus a big fuss. And sometimes it's cursing, sometimes it's crying, sometimes it's a gesture. It could be any number of things that becomes the overlay on top of the message, the double bind message. Uh, first bind is the obligation, that's the message. The second bind is the fuss that goes over the top. And uh, oftentimes uh, people use anger in order to get this double message uh, across. And uh, then the other party in the marriage will say, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore because this party is going to get angry and I want to keep peace in the house. Next we have the diversionary message. And the diversionary message is one that shifts the focus from the true issue by the change of subject or by calling the person by a certain name, giving a, a name. Uh, uh, only a dodo would do this, for instance, and therefore you must be the dodo. A diversionary message. 
what this is, it's a, it's a red herring to pull you off of the issue, and then that way you don't have to deal with it. You can go on to something else, and if you keep prolonging that long enough, guess what? Then it's over because you haven't treated the issue. Now, there are some people who think this is an excellent way to resolve issues. And uh, I'm reminded of the uh, Persian story of Shahrazad and how the king uh, would have a different woman every night. And at the end uh, of his uh, dalliance with her, he would have her put to death. And so when it became Shahrazad's turn, she thought, and she thought, well, how can I dissuade the king from, you know, killing me? So she decided that she was going to tell the king a story. And by the time that the night was over, she would say, I'm sorry, I can't finish the story because there's a follow-up story that goes to it. I'll have to tell you tomorrow. And so that's how we have the beginning of the uh, Thousand and One Nights, or the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. And it just kept going and going and going, and finally that's how she was managed to survive. Gunny sacking, the next uh, type of dishonest communication. Dishonest communication is actually chain uh, diversionary messaging. And uh, this is when you uh, go from one diversionary message to another and to another and to another so that the uh, issue is not resolved. Then I introduce you to Pedro and Juanita and the dialogue that they have, and then I'm going to introduce you to the awareness circle, and that's where we are going to start in today. So the story of Pedro and Juanita has to do with his uh, staying home on Saturday uh, morning, getting up late and fixing his breakfast, and uh, they have a dialogue, and she uh, uh, comes into the uh, kitchen and uh, the dialogue continues. Well, this is the truncated uh, <laughs> dialogue here, and uh, we see that Juanita says, I'm glad that you decided to go ahead and fix your own breakfast. Pedro responds by saying, I don't know if I can eat now. I gag just thinking about the way that the fridge smells. Do you know that I found a half carton of milk that was dated 2015? Well, Look at this message. What kind of message is this? You see. Now I've got it coded here for you. And so let me give the key down at the bottom. This is a backdoor message. He is telling her that uh, somewhere along the line she has to uh, start cleaning out the fridge because there's milk in there that's a year, 18 months old. Like, uh, how often do you clean the fridge? So she responds and she says, those things happen failing to take responsibility for not cleaning the refrigerator. And then uh, she includes a diversionary message by saying, you know, I bought you some hot sauce, and it's diet hot sauce, immediately stimulating a conversation <coughs> to another subject. He responds with a double bind message saying, light hot sauce? Have you ever tasted light hot sauce? Like, what's the matter with you, woman, trying to buy that kind of stuff? You know it's no good. It'll just stay in the fridge until the year 2020. And once again, we have your under um, responsibility message here. In other words, I'm not going to take it. So it won't be my fault. She responds with a diversionary message saying, have you read the article in the Inquirer? And he responds with his uh, message by saying, is that all that you do? Um, you read that garbage, and then he brings in the mother, and uh, he brings in the fact that they don't do any work. And so you have these messagings that keep going round and more round, and nothing really gets solved. Until finally, uh, Pedro decides that he is going to apologize for insulting his mother-in-law. And so when he does, Juanita responds with silence. And now we have the silent message. So we can ask the question, was Pedro sincere in his apology? doesn't matter because they're enmeshed in this awful turmoil. And it doesn't matter if he is sincere or not. And uh, she responds with a silent message. So now his feelings are hurt and he is offended. And you have the escalation or you have that 
um, whirlwind of an argument taking place. And then Pedro says, well, you have to admit that I'm right. So he now comes back with a counter punch and she returns with the silence again. Then um, Pedro says, hey, come on, I'm sorry. Can we start this all over again? In other words, let's see what we can do. And it's a diversionary thing. And uh, nothing actually gets resolved. Now let me introduce you to the awareness circle. The awareness circle. This is a graphic which is designed to allow you to walk into a conversation and to be able to analyze what is actually taking place. And you'll notice that I have a circle here and that they're all different colors. And so let me give you the key to the colors. First of all, there is the sense, and you'll notice that that refers to that blue slice at the top of the circle. And then there is the interpretation of what is being seen, and that is uh, depicted by the red slice in the circle. And then there is the feeling. This is the visceral response that you have upon coming into that certain situation and there's this feeling that you have, you can't help it. It is an emotional response to what you have seen and what you have interpreted. And then you come to the purple slice in the circle, and this is the intent. This is the plan that is now in your head. This is what I'm going to do. And then lastly, we have the action, and this is the action that you take as far as the plan that you have decided. So let's uh, review these again. Once again, you have the sense. And this is what you see, you hear, you experience through the senses. This is the empirical part of your first introduction to a bad conversation that you're having with your marriage partner, or actually with anybody else. But since we're talking about marriage, this is the bad thing that you sense, that you see, you hear, and uh, it has to do uh, with your marriage partner. The interpretation is the interpretation of what you have sensed. You sense that there's something there, you're not really sure what it is, but you are inclined to go with the sense that you have. And immediately your emotions or your feelings kick in, and you will say something like, who does he think he is for being angry at me? Because he is angry at me. The intent then is, I'm going to formulate a plan. I'll fix him. This is what I'm going to do. I will fix him for what he has done or what he is doing. And then the action is, the act on the plan that uh, you have formulated, and you take some action so that you will have a much better feel over the situation. Okay. Now, all of these things seem logical and seem, well, this is a, something reasonable that a person should do. So let me see if I can illustrate this for you in this regard. Maybe you've seen this commercial on, um, on TV, and uh, I'll take off my uh, microphone so that you can hear this a little bit better. Okay, I'm sure that you've seen this commercial several times on TV. And let's see if we can look at this in the um, awareness circle. First of all, we have the sense. It's in the middle of the night. It's a hushed up phone call. So there's something suspicious. And the senses of the wife as she comes down the stairs are stimulated because it's the middle of the night. See. There's something strange going on here for whatever her frame of reference may be. The interpretation is, my husband must be having an affair. It might be an online affair, you know, where he has been texting or he's been IMing 
And so now he's taking the next step and they're making an actual phone call so that he's talking to the other party. And so my husband must be having an affair. That's the interpretation. So notice once again that the blue slice is little because there's very little information that goes into the census. Notice that the interpretation is larger than the sense or the intake of what the senses are getting. And then notice that the feeling or the emotions are way bigger. The proportion is over twice what the senses have um, harvested and uh, twice of what the interpretation must be. And so she is feeling, he must think that I'm uh, easy to fool. He, he's betraying me. Uh, you know, he thinks that in the middle of the night that I'm not going to notice. He's doing this behind my back. And so there is this uh, feeling that comes due to the interpretation. And so then there is the intent. And so she says, I'm going to embarrass the two of them. I'll show them I'm no fool. So what does she do? She takes action. Takes the phone out of his hands. Okay, Jake from State Farm, what are you wearing? See? And so here you have the action that has come to play. This is the way that most people have their conversations. This is the way that most people try to resolve those difficult situations in their marriage. So let's uh, look at this from a different standpoint. The sense. My husband is on the phone in the middle of the night. He never gets up unless it's to go to the bathroom. And this ain't the bathroom, so what's up? So there, right away, her <coughs> sense is now opening up. She wants to know more before making a judgment. She wants to get facts. And so now the blue section, you notice, is quite a bit larger than all the other sections. In fact, it's equivalent to all the other sections of the circle. And this is the primary thing that you need to do in order to eliminate arguments from your marriage, and that is to get the full sense of what is taking place. The interpretation. My husband is so worried that he's on the phone trying to get a better deal. He must be under a lot of pressure. If he's up in the middle of the night, maybe he woke up because he couldn't sleep because he had to figure out something needs to be done. A claim needs to be made, or he needs to get a better uh, uh, contractual deal with the uh, insurance company. And so the interpretation is now mollified with a much greater um, proportion as far as the sense is concerned. The feel, what is it that she feels? Well, first of all, there should be a feeling of relief. Well, he's not having an affair. There should be reassurance. He is worried for the family. He has a concern for the family. And then concern. If this keeps up, he's going to get sick. And so this is a much better way in which to conduct this particular um, situation. The intent. I will help him get out of, or I will help him get our spending under control. Whatever the problem is, she has now decided that instead of criticizing him, instead of trying to find some fault and getting up in the middle of the night, that she's going to do something that will be of a help to him. And the action is I'll get him a light snack and get him uh, to come back to bed as soon as possible so that this does not become a worrisome sore. So this is the awareness circle. Now I know that <clears throat> covering the meta language and the awareness circle is a lot of information to take, but hopefully it will uh, come into uh, your state of thinking so that you will be able to make it play. All right, the biblical instruction on communication. We note once again that it's in Ephesians 4, verses 25 through 32. And we begin with the first verse in, in this section, which is verse 25. And so if you'll open your Bibles, we'll take a look at this verse by verse. Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> and verse 25. 
And it says, therefore, having, or therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So the very first part of the instruction from the Bible is that you have to be committed to honesty. Okay. What is it that I mean by this? When people enter into a discussion to resolve some kind of a dispute, which is what an argument is, or that's what's supposed to be, there are those individuals who just have it as their commitment, I'm going to prove him wrong. That's the wrong aim to have. You need to be committed to honesty. And when both parties are committed to honesty, you have a much better chance of resolving your issues. When it doesn't resolve, it's because one or the other of the old sin natures will rebel against the teaching of the Word of God. There isn't anything that you can do against rebellion against the Word of God rejection of the word of God. There isn't anything that you can do. You could, you know, slap the person around and say, hey, be obedient to the word of God, but that never works. And so the first thing is that you need to be committed to honesty. Verse 25, you have a word uh, which is in the aorist active uh, participle. Now the active voice is what is known as the deponent because this is a me verb, apotithemi, um, and apotithemi is a deponent, which means that the form is in the passive, but the uh, sense is in the active. And so this is an aorist active <coughs> participle. The participle is involved here because it means that something is taking place in the background, and then something is taking place in the foreground. The action of the aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. This is the rule concerning the action or the way that an aorist participle behaves. And this means that before you can start to talk, you need to eliminate falsehoods or deceptions. So the action of the aorist participle, which is laying aside, that's the apotetemito pseudos. Pseudos, you can see the word pseudo in there, and it means to lay aside that which is pseudo, that is what, that which is false. And so the aorist participle says this is what you must do first before you begin to talk. After you have laid aside the falsehood, then talk. So, in your commitment to honesty, it means that first of all you have to be honest with yourself, get out of that denial funk, and you have to say what is true and what is not. Now, let me say right now at the outset that this is easier said than done. It's a lot harder for you to actually confront yourself and say, I am living in fantasy land to believe this. And so, first you have to deal with yourself to get rid of that falsehood and then you're ready to talk with your partner. Having laid aside the lie, that is, having laid aside disingenuous messages, silent messages, unconfessed sin, then talk truthfully. And that's what our verse says. Verse 25 says, Therefore, laying aside falsehoods, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. The passage is very clear. Actually, I really don't even have to do much grammatical footwork on this because it's plain in English. So, first you lay aside the falsehood and then you're able to talk. And when you talk, bring out the truth. So, letter B. And here we come to some of the personal advice. First of all, be courageous enough to say what you think. If you don't say what you think, you're holding back and you're not being truthful. So have the courage to say what you think. Be confident in knowing that you can actually make worthwhile contributions to the conversation. In other words, what you have to say is not only important, but it is worthwhile. And I know that there are some times, and uh, through uh, the fault of, uh, of flawed Bible teaching, 
that uh, it has been taught that only the husband has something which is worthwhile. The truth is that you have two people in a marriage and the husband is the one that tosses in the uh, tie-breaking vote. But both parties have something important to contribute. The Lord, when we have seen this from Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, the Lord made man after his own image. And that meant both male and female created he them. Do you remember when we studied that? That means that both have equal footing. It's just that one of them has been given the power <coughs> of breaking the deadlock. Secondly, take time each day to be aware of your opinions and feelings so that you can adequately convey them to others. Let me repeat this. Take time every day to become aware of your opinions and feelings so that you can adequately convey them to the other party. What happens a lot of times is that somebody will just think the situation over and over and over and just overthink rather than thinking how can I express my true feelings or my true concerns in a way that will be acceptable? They're just thinking, he said this, he said that, she said this, she said that. And so it bears a great deal of warrant to be repeated that you should take time every day to take an inventory of how you feel about a certain situation and to repeat it. You may even get into a room by yourself and say it aloud so that you can hear what it sounds like. And uh, say it again and again until you're able to sculpt your message in such a way that you can convey it to the other person. Because if you use some words or some gestures, your voice, your words may be rejected out of hand and there will never be the encoding or the decoding of that vocabulary. So take time each day, practice. To speak honestly does not mean that you are speaking out of arrogance. To speak honestly does not mean that you are speaking from the source of arrogance. Now there are some people who do speak out of a sense of arrogance and they almost always like to preface their remarks with, I like to be blunt. Well, hello, blunt axe. Doesn't work. So instead, you need to understand that you have a value for the relationship that has been designed by God. It's called marriage. And that relationship was designed by God for two people who are both rational and relational. Both people are both rational and relational. The rational part is that particular part of the mentality which is like God's. And the rational part is that part of your soul makeup which is like God. God does not exist as a mono um, deity. He has a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit a triune God. This is the reason that God is completely happy. He has never a time when he is unhappy because he is able to share his happiness with somebody else. He is a relational being, a relational deity. There are no other deities in all of the creeds, uh, all the religious creeds in the history of uh, the human race where a relation is set up to pass between God and man. And that relationship is one in which man is brought up to the place where he is able to share the happiness of God, which is perfect, not found in any other uh, creedal structure. OK, we've seen uh, letter B, have the courage to say what you think. Letter C, the practice of communication skills. 
To develop communication skills means that you begin even with simple interactions that may be between you and your child. And um, these interactions can be conversations that will range all the way from social interactions to professional interactions. So you may begin by interacting with your children. Your children are nice because they will forgive you uh, because they think you're the best thing that ever happened. You can move into a professional uh, realm when you go to the doctor's office and you express to your doctor what you feel uh, as far as your body is concerned to help the diagnostic process. And then you can also practice by talking to other people or talking in public. That way you can marshal your thoughts so that you can produce them in a logical, coherent way. And so developing communication skills begin with these simple interactions and they can either be social actions like within the family or they can be professional actions like when you go to a doctor, you go to a job interview, you're at the store, or they can just be your own personal development of how you want to develop this particular skill. New skills take time. They take time to refine, but each time that you use communication skills, you open yourself to enriching the relationships that you have. If you do not, if you do not refine your skills, you are not going to enrich your relationship. You may love the woman that you marry. And the old story is told about uh, the old boy who uh, became a widow and uh, uh, he finally went to a counselor after she died and the counselor said, well, do you miss her? He says, yeah. Well, did she love you? He said, yeah. Well, did you love her? He said, yeah. Did you tell her? Yeah. When? 50 years ago when we were first married. That doesn't enrich the relationship. All that does is that puts two people under the same roof and you have a certain amount of interaction with one another, but the relationship is not enriched. <laughs> there has to be the verbal exchange for your relationship to exchange. Make eye contact. Now, this is very, very important because oftentimes when couples speak to one another, they'll look at the floor, they'll look at the wall, they'll look past the other person, but you need to look into each other's eyes. You need to look into each other's eyes because this is the way in which two relational creatures are able to make contact. So whether you are the speaker or the listener, need to look into the eyes of the person with whom you are conversing. This is particularly true and many folks have found this to be so when they are raising their children. And one of their children just does not want to do what they're told. And so you sit them on your lap and you tell, listen Johnny, look me in the eye because I'm going to talk to you. And the kid doesn't want to look into your eyes. Why? Because it's that very simple dynamic that when you look into the other person's eyes, you are going to have an understanding. When the child doesn't want to look into your eyes, that's rebellion. When the other person in your marriage doesn't want to look you in the eye, that's rebellion. There is something rotten in the state of Denmark. So look into the other person's eyes, and it doesn't matter whether you're the speaker or the hearer. It is imperative that you look into each other's eyes. Eye contact produces soul-to-soul -soul contact, and that's what you want your relationship to be. You want to be more than just animals that are under the same shelter, eat from the same trough. You want to have that communication, and that makes your interaction more successful and that much more rewarding. Spencer Tracy, or, uh, okay. <clears throat> eye contact 
conveys interest and encourages your partner to be interested in what you have to say. When you are giving eye contact, because the person is more mature than a little child who will rebel just at any cost, now when an adult rebels at any cost, you know that there's a vast amount of immaturity. In which case, you know, you should ask the Lord, please make my spouse more mature so that we are able to carry this relationship off. So eye contact encourages interest um, within your partner so that that partner will be interested in what it is that you have to say. Next, use common courtesy. I find this to be sometimes uh, a bit salient. You probably notice this. Maybe you're having an argument with your spouse, and you're, you know, like cats and dogs, wow, 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 back and forth, back and forth. The phone rings. The spouse picks up the phone, and that spouse is the sweetest thing that came out of the hand of God. Why is that? I said. And so, <clears throat> use common courtesy. Even though you are speaking to your spouse, be courteous to that person. That's the person that you have vowed to live with. That is the person that you have given your promise to. That is the person who is expecting your love not your backbiting, not your bitterness. <laughs> so use common courtesy. The first part of common courtesy is become a better listener. In other words, listen better than you have been. So you do this, first of all, by removing distractions. That's one of the reasons why I put up that screen there with the cell phone, with the text messages. Okay, because you need to remove all distractions. The most important thing that you'll ever do today is take in Bible doctrine on a face-to-face -face basis. There is nothing more important than that. If you think that there is, you are part of the problem in this country. That's why this country is going downhill as fast as it is, because of people like you. And so you need to take responsibility for your flaccitude. So the first thing you should do when your partner starts telling you uh, or talking to you is to put away anything that you might have that might distract you from his or her words. So turn off the TV. Close your laptop. Put down anything else that you would be reading uh, or anything that you might be doing. You may be out weeding or you may be out changing the oil on your car. Stop what you're doing. Give full uh, faith and credit to your spouse. It's very difficult to hear and to understand what someone is saying when you are surrounded by other sounds or activities that are actually competing for your attention. And when you give more attention to your cell phone, when your spouse is talking to you, you're saying to your, to your spouse, I don't, I don't think that you're as important as whoever it is that is just texting me. This is part of common courtesy. When you're at the restaurant and you're having dinner with some friends and your cell phone goes off, what are you doing? You're being discourteous to your guests. You're being discourteous <laughs> to the people that you're with because you're saying you're not as important as this little gadget that I have here. And you say, well, we just can't live without it. Do you know that for 2,000 plus years, people have been getting along without cell phones? And they've gotten along just fine. Whether the conversation you are having is over the phone or in person, because sometimes you may be talking to your spouse over the phone, it uh, can help for you to move to a room that is free from distractions or to go to a place where you won't be interrupted by others. And so you may be at a party, you may be at a dinner, you may be at a meeting. Go and speak in private with your spouse.
And then you need to stay focused. When the other person speaks, focus on what it is that they are saying. Don't let your mind jump ahead to what you think you should say in reply. I remember one time I was having a conversation with my middle daughter and uh, we were talking about something that she had uh, done wrong and she was giving me her justification for what she was doing. And she said, Dad, listen to me. Don't just think of what you're going to say next and just wait your turn. And that's precisely what this point is. Don't just be sitting there like a lump on a log and wait your turn to speak. Listen to what the other person has to say. Focus on what they are saying. Watch the person's face, their eyes, and their body. And answer to yourself this question. What is that other person really trying to say? When you are able to answer that question, then you are ready to proceed in replying in the conversation. Part of staying focused and really listening involves interpreting a person's silences. Now this is important because we're talking about communication and sometimes communication is done in a non-verbal way. There is verbal communication, non-verbal communication, and paraverbal communication. And you need to be able to read all three of them so that you know what is actually being said to you. And so part of staying focused and really listening involves interpreting uh, that person's silences and noticing his or her body language as well. These nonverbal ways of communicating are just as important as verbal communication as in words. Letter D. All right, let's review this. First of all, we are members one of another, so we need to have mutual respect for one another. Uh, <clears throat> there is the use of common courtesy, there is the staying focused, and then there is to be, or shall we say, to not be self-centered. And being self-centered sometimes is misinterpreted, but uh, let's get it down to where it really takes place. And that is that there are many people who find it hard to concentrate during conversations because they feel self-conscious about how they appear to the other person. And so they are so conscious about how they look or how they appear that they're not paying attention to what is being said. And so you need to get away from that. It might hurt because that means that you won't be the center of attention for those moments. And you're not used to not being the center of attention. And so you need to uh, look hard and, so that you can concentrate on what the other person is saying. It uh, may help to know that if someone is speaking their mind to you, that it isn't likely that they are judging you at the same time. So if somebody is being honest with you and they are telling you what it is that they're thinking, the most logical thing for you to conclude is that they're not judging you right now. They are busy telling you what they feel. And so the speaker will be grateful that you are giving that person, that you are giving the speaker, a listening ear. Being a good listener is having the ability to stop thinking about yourself during the conversation. Let me repeat this. Being a good listener is having the ability to stop thinking about yourself during the conversation. If you're busy thinking about your own insecurities or your own needs, then you aren't paying attention to what that person is saying. Okay, we've looked at letter A, and that is be committed to honesty. And we've looked at the second point now, the mutual respect uh, that you should give to one another. Um, I haven't touched on the Greek uh, for that, but uh, it's the Greek word hekastos, and that word means eat. <coughs> each person. And so this puts the emphasis on the two people that are speaking. Each person is given this command. You are members of one another. Uh, you need to use common courtesy, each one. Each one needs to stay focused. Each one needs 
not to be self-centered during the conversation. And next, uh, no name calling. No name calling. I don't think that that really needs a whole lot of definition. I think we all understand what that means. And uh, no name calling is a way of putting the brakes on escalating and using a diversionary uh, tactic as far as the conversation is concerned. We then come to the sixth subpoint here, and that is no disdainful tone of voice. And you heard me say that there's verbal communication, there's nonverbal communication, but there's also paraverbal communication, and this is where the tone of voice comes in. Paraverbal messages are those that we transmit through the tone, the pitch, and the pacing of our voices. And it's important that we recognize what it is that we're doing. There are some people who they talk and they don't know what they're doing. All they're doing is spitting out words. Their jaw is moving up and down and their brain is in neutral. They don't know what they're doing. The person who is taking these biblical instructions knows that there is more than one level of activity that is going on here. And in knowing that there are these multiple levels, he's able, and she's able, to make the proper adjustments so as to be um, honorable to the Lord. So this has to do with the tone of voice, the pitch. When you're angry, did you know that when you get angry, your pitch goes up? Not very much, but enough. And then there's the pacing of your words. So paraverbal communication is the way in which we say things. That's the method or the way in which we deliver our message. So let me give you an example. And here's the example, very uh, insipid. I didn't say you were stupid, okay? And I know that the word stupid carries a very negative connotation, but that's why it's in here. So here is the first variation. I didn't say you were stupid. And see what that is? That is part of the paraverbal. Or secondly, I didn't say you were stupid. And so now you have a different variation. And then thirdly, I didn't say you were stupid. I say, or I didn't say you were stupid. And then last of all, I didn't say you were stupid. See? How about I didn't say you were stupid? <laughs> you left out that door. <laughs> yes. There you are. Just the plain statement itself. Just the plain brown paper bag statement. They're all derogatory. But I want to illustrate to you that there are at least five different ways that you can deliver a candid message. And it speaks volumes. And you may say, well, I didn't actually say that. But it's the way your tone is. You just aren't aware of it because you're not aware that there's this other level, but that is exactly what you've done. Our emotional register is what commands our tone, our pitch, and our pace. Therefore, it's imperative that we learn to control our emotions. Our emotional register, that is our emotion, the way that we're made up emotionally and the way that we've allowed our emotions to develop within our souls, that commands the tone, the pitch, and the pace of our speech. And so it's very important, it's uh, imperative that we learn to control our emotions. Everybody knows this in the back of their head. That's why we use the term he knows how to push her buttons. Why? Because he's, I know how to push her over the edge so that she will become emotional and become the raving uh, maniac that she is. <clears throat> Letter G. When making eye contact, try to be on the same level so it doesn't appear that you're looking down your nose at your partner. If you're going to be having a serious discussion with your marital partner, both of you sit at the table. Don't one sit and the other one stand. Because the one that stands has the automatic, natural 
advantage. Now, it may not be. The arguments may be stronger on the, on the part of the person who's sitting down. But just this paraverbal communication says, I'm standing up, therefore I have the advantage. You know how you know that this is true? The both of you can be sitting at a table. You're having a very heated conversation. And then you stand up because you want to make your point clear. What is that? I want to show you I got the advantage. See? So in our study so far in verse 25, you need to be committed to honesty and to mutual respect. Very important that this is done. All right, let's see how much time we've got back left here. All right, let's take our break. We'll come back in a few minutes. Thank you.